It's fantastic to be here, and after we had such amazing food, I do hope that I'm able to add a bit of food for thought on top um, of what you already have in your stomach, and um, that uh, you also get something to take along. Now, Doreen yesterday showed us a slide, and the slide was saying, stop dreaming, start doing. And I kind of tend to disagree with you a bit. I think we should never stop dreaming, because this is what has brought us here. It's dreams that bring us together and that push us going further. But we should also look into execution. And I want to propose today a model of how we can turn one dream into reality, building a house together. And the concept for this is fractional ownership. We have talked about it. I'm still missing a better word. So if anyone brings one up, I'd be more than happy to learn about it. But before I get into it, a few words about myself. So my career actually started in development corporation or development aid, as it was formerly known. Um, I spent a number of years in Ethiopia working with the African Union on establishing the Pan-African uh, governance architecture. Went on from there to help setting up uh, the African University or Pan-African University and had some smaller gigs, fantastic photos um, in other parts of the world as well. Now most of this was in public sector. And I had the privilege of working with extremely talented people, both in the organization as well as the partners with whom we were working. And at the same time, I still grew frustrated because we didn't really move fast. Execution was lacking, and I think TK was saying the opposite helps. In some instances, I couldn't agree more. So it was for me a very small step to uh, leave the public sector, and after doing my MBA, start my own companies. And there are unfortunately not quite a few of them. Something went wrong along the line. There's CEO Network, it's an advisory firm that I have in Germany, where we do development corporations still, but we try to do a bit more innovative and a bit more effectively. There's the Boys Club, Cambrian Futures in uh, Berkeley, where we work on making AI more responsible, we work with governments as well as corporations in a number of different fields. Couldn't find a better picture. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's also an asset management company, so we don't look so professional in this one, but um, it's an asset management company where we securitize alternative and digital assets, currently up to 20, uh, 200,000 acres of rainforest and Paraguay to make it bankable for carbon credit projects. And then, last but not least, there's my layer that is a boutique company in Florida where we do a bit of real estate. Now, all those companies are admittedly extremely diverse, and yet they have taught me one important lesson. And the lesson is, if you have one goal and people pursuing that, that is really unfolding energy. <laughs> and that is, however, only one part of the coin. The second part is ownership. If people have ownership in the organization, then you can actually achieve something and drive something further. It is not enough to only share the objective, it is also about having ownership together. <laughs> So, when I got one of those amazing emails from Learn, I think it was November last year, you know, again, pictures all over, a beautiful place, we've seen it today, right? I was like, damn, I really want to become a part of this. <laughs> I've been following it for over three years, and then like, how can we do this? And then we got on a call, I wanted to participate in the death round, and then Learn said, okay, there are actually a few others that also want just to invest a bit, and uh, can we not do something together? And that reminded me of, how we've built companies in Germany, the United States, and Switzerland, bringing people together and giving people ownership in the company. And building on my experience with uh, my Cattleya in Florida, we started to do a joint venture. And the joint venture is what I want to talk with you about today, because this is essentially the vehicle for investing together in one of the lots here in Bucco Village North. Now, let me talk quickly about real estate investment, and it's not my core competency, right? And that's why I keep it rather simple and high level. There are currently two ways of investing in real estate. Either you buy, you go out, you buy a house, you rent it out, you live in it yourself, and you sell it at some point. Or you go and invest in a real estate trust. Now, I believe we're all here not purely for investment purposes. That's why I skip the second part and focus on the first. What is the problem with investing in real estate, you alone, in one house? Depending on the assets that you have available or the money that you have available, um, you put quickly too much equity into one house alone, right? 
And if you do so, you lack diversification. And what do you do with it, right? If it is your second home, for most of us, this probably is here in Costa Rica, what do you do with that really? Do you need a house alone? Yes. <laughs> for many, however, it is just too expensive. And I want to give you a small scene from one of my favorite movies, uh, Thank You for Smoking, where Nick Naylor, one of the main characters, brings it to, point, to the point. And we have sound. Well, 99% of everything done in the world, good or bad, is done to pay a mortgage. So perhaps the world would be a better place if everyone rented it. <laughs> right. I think we're here um, uh, also realizing that mortgage even is not always the option, right? So we don't want to do, uh, we don't want to pay for 40 years. And if you're a foreigner in Costa Rica, I can say for Germany, there's no bank that is currently lending me the money. So even mortgage is no option. So this is an additional problem of the traditional real estate investment way. So this is the way today, right? One person goes out, buys a home, and if you actually want to sell it again, you know, you might break it up into different units and then sell the individual units, or you just use it for yourself, hope that the value goes up, and then you sell it later. That could be the future. You take a different or a number of people, all of them get a share in an LLC, it's as simple as that, and then the LLC buys the house, and that is fractional ownership. Right? Instead of you going directly buying the house, you, you create a company that has no other purpose than owning the real estate, and by owning a share in that company, you own a share of real estate. Extremely simple, no rocket science, and yet, for many, it sounds like timeshare. And yet again, <laughs> Melissa, I'm looking at you. <laughs> you wanted to give me a concept for how I can explain the difference between uh, timeshares and uh, fractional ownership. And I let someone else speak first. So something might be thinking, how do I hold are, you, are you going to tell me that they are a scam? Because surely everybody knows that. And it is true that the sketchiness of timeshare vacations has been a punchline on TV for years. You moron, these aren't free vacations. These are timesharing deals. They're total scams. These timeshare people, they don't stop until they sell you something. They they prey on the weak and gullible. I eat you. Perhaps you and your yellow friend would like to set up a timeshare plan. Don't do it, Sammy! I won't give in to your timeshare vacation scam! <laughs> okay, I think we had a certain time lag here, but I'm also pretty sure you all get the point, right? But, um, Timeshares, according to many, I personally believe the same, are a scam. So, what makes fractional ownership different? Or, let's start with how it works. So, we talked about having a company. You buy shares in the company that holds nothing else than the dream home, idly here, a beautiful three-bedroom apartment, uh, lot for Yoko Village North. <laughs> you use the home, or in proportion to what you own, Right? The more you own in terms of shares, the more you can use it. You rent it out during the time none of the co-owners is using it, creating benefits for all of us, because according to the shares that you're holding in the company, you get a return out of it. It's paid out. It can be managed. It's usually managed. Um, uh, in this case, Yoko Village would manage um, uh, the timeshare. Um, how? Uh, sorry. <laughs> 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 Well, I've been thinking so much about timeshares now, you know, I kind of get confused. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly, and the benefits of the rental income and when you sell the apartment are distributed amongst the co-owners according to the shares. So, now we talk about what the real differences are, right? So, in timeshare, you buy the right to use a property. You are not actually owning it. And that is a massive problem. Because if you're not owning it, you're not benefiting when it appreciates in value, right? And you're not benefiting from it when it generates income. Fractional ownership is different. Through the company, you actually actively own a part of the company, a uh, part of the uh, real estate, and because of that, you can make money out of the value appreciation as well as the rental income. That's true. 
The thing is that also with timeshares, um, you have usually less owners. So um, uh, with, uh, <laughs> with fractional ownership, Jesus, I'm mixing it up today, it's too late. So fractional ownership, less owners, the timeshares, many owners. The maximum that I've seen was in a timeshare setup, 52 owners, and you can imagine what that means to a place. While usually when you go for a fractional ownership setup, you would find somewhere between eight and maximum 14 um, somewhat owners or co-owners that are owning it. So that also means if you want to use that place, different than in a timeshare setup, you could decide as owners to put a storage room somewhere where you even leave your personal belongings that you lock up when it's being rented out. So it's really your place, right? And that's not the case when we talk about timeshares. And it's nothing new. Fractional ownership has been around, but mainly in commercial real estate, right? In commercial real estate, it's very normal that companies are being set up with different investors that own the real estate and that benefit from it. Yeah. Now, since COVID, we've seen a number of companies popping up that are actually doing fractional ownership. And that is mainly due to the fact that people are realizing they want to have a second home somewhere where it's beautiful and it doesn't make sense, you know, to put all your money into a house that you are not using um, the entire time. And we had a discussion around uh, real estate and tokenization of real estate that probably has also helped um, the conversation. So there are now a number of companies out there. Uh, Pascal has raised 1.4 uh, billion. So market value doesn't tell us a lot, but it just shows us that it has come into the mainstream and we want to bring the model and the idea not to Yoko Village, not with such a big company in the background, but to do case by case, um, house um, per house. So, in fractional ownership, you still need to put some money in, right? And if you cannot take a mortgage because you're a foreigner, and if even, let's say, in our case, 50K is too much for you, I just want to take you through um, one small thing um, that is relevant for American citizens, since I believe you have quite a few here in the audience. Self-directed individual retirement accounts are probably the most boring, but at the same time, also the most interesting source of funding that is oftentimes overlooked. SDIRAs, um, they are fantastic because you don't pay taxes on the profit. So you can invest it without being taxed on the profit. You take the profit out, you reinvest it. You only pay taxes the moment you actually pay yourself out the retirement funds, which is obviously much later. And that allows you to, um, uh, um, to make advantage of the compound interest. And I'll talk about that in a second again. The downsides and the limitations, however, are that SDIRAs should not be confused with a normal IRA. Sorry for being a bit technical here. If your retirement account is run by your employer, then you wouldn't have an SDIRA. Then you would have a 401k. But if you're actually managing it yourself because you're an entrepreneur or because you have sold your company, then you are eligible for this. And you can use that money also to invest in real estate in Costa Rica, money that otherwise would be sitting around. Only problem, especially when we talk about fractional ownership, is that you and your direct family cannot use the property. So you would need to see it as an investment vehicle primarily rather than a self-use uh, unit. Now we still have investors in the joint venture where they are not married and therefore can make use of it. And what we can also see is that um, uh, we can structure the agreements in a way that the self-use clause doesn't apply to you so that it's actually legally um, applicable and eligible for you as well. We've done that already in the past. So I want to come back to reinvest uh, um, profits and make use of the compound interest rates. And since we talk about money, I'm kind of afraid we don't get around math. And I want you to remember this formula. And when you don't understand it, I didn't so either. Compounded interest rates is best explained by what's called Rule 72. It goes back to Albert Einstein, true fact. And what it means is, 72, you take that number, so if you... If you make an investment and the investment has a return of 10%, the rule of 72 tells you that 7.2 years it will take in order to double the money that you're making, uh, that you have pre-invested. That means if you invest 100,000 at an annual interest rate of 10%, after 7.2 years, it's 200,000. And this compounded interest rate effect makes all the sense in the world if you go for SDIRAs. And then it actually looks pretty nice. The curve is pretty steep. 
Okay, with this excursion, let's talk about joint ventures here in Costa Rica. We have started a joint venture together in order to build this amazing three-bedroom apartment. It is in Lot 4, and it is in Yoko Village North. So again, how does it work? We have set up the company already, so it is existing. Uh, Yoko Village is a co-investor because they have contributed the land. We as investors, we do not need to buy it. Right? Yoko is contributing to it, and as such, they are part of the co-ownership arrangement, which I believe is fantastic. Every investor who is coming in gets uh, a share in the company uh, in return for the investment according to the size of the investment, obviously. Then the villa is built once we have all the money together. That's why we are here today. And then um, uh, the co-owners can use it at a reduced rate, and that's important. We have decided not to allow self-use for free because some of us might not be able to use it at all. And we want to make it fair so that uh, for those who can make use of it and others who cannot, that those who cannot still benefit at least from the rental income. Now that's however a rule that we have set up and that can be changed, right? Um, uh, we as co-owners, we meet once a year in order to have a meeting and we can change those rules. But we have set it up because we believe it's the fairest way possible. And we have also decided um, that we already put in the contract at what point in time the villa is sold. Because that's usually the most difficult thing in fractional ownership. If you have so many owners and you do not agree on a predetermined event when you sell, because then eight people or ten people want to sell at different times and it becomes extremely challenging. So we have redefined that. We say at least 40% uh, return on invest and then we sell. What it means is we put the villa on the market the moment it's being built and the moment we get to this investment, it goes back. Uh, we sell it. Now we had quite a few people that were saying, okay, it's nice, I see the investment case, but I actually would like to stay longer. I would like to have a monotonous investment. And to those, and I would count myself into that as well, I would be saying, let's use this first joint venture, get to know each other, and then go out together, choose a lot that we like, because now we have picked it for you, choose a lot we like, and then do a second joint venture that is more focused on a more long-term arrangement. So this is a very easy entrance, a very easy um, setup to get uh, into Yoko uh, and your foot in the door. Right, um, you have seen it, I don't need to show it. Um, lot four is the street number one. This is the first house that we've visited, the house that is ready. The house next to it is almost ready as well. Um, this one is not yet ready, or it's not being built and we would be there. What I heard and what is good about the location, Jeffrey was telling me, we get the 100 MBS uh, uh, megabyte internet connection because it's uh, at the beginning of the village, so we basically get all the good internet and everyone else will. I have to hope that we are not downloading any Netflix videos. That's the property. Sorry. Well, exactly. So, important, very important. Um, those are uh, it's the titles. Uh, we've got the construction plans. It's the titles. I wanted to get to this point in a bit. So, the point is, all of this already exists, right? It is already transferred to the company. The company already owns it. And essentially, and I think this is so important. It means the moment we close this, we can start building. And because we have already so much money on the account, and if the rest of the money is coming in, you know, we won't have any delay in the construction process. It will all be prepaid, so to say, and we should be ready um, with uh, starting the house uh, very soon, and then finish, and Jeffrey told me that earlier, I just checked with him. In one year time, if we close in the, within the next couple of days, in one year time, and that's already with a time buffer, we should have the house um, set up and um, uh, ready to use. So that's the villa again, again horizontal, three bedroom apartment, uh, beautiful design, we all do know it, the construction plans are there and all. So what is the business case? Um, we've talked about it, you can invest 300k, um, uh, that's the value of the land, right? And we have transferred the titles already to the company, so all of this is done. Uh, we are now um, finalizing the race, 50k is the minimum ticket size. 
Uh, we then start the construction. The construction blueprints are already there. Um, uh, we have already partly put the money into it. Um, Yoko will then manage and oversee the construction. We assume it will take 12 months. So if we meet here again in one year time, we should be able to live in it um, and use it. And yeah, we are basically ready. So the use of the villa is for three purposes. First of all, it's an investment, right? As I've said, we put it directly on the market. We aim for 40% return. It's an easy entry for those who then want to have something more long term. We pick a lot together and go for a second shavy. We do rent it out during the time we cannot sell it and during the time we are not using it. Again, the rental income is distributed according to the shareholders um, at the end of each year. And then there is uh, the self use uh, that, uh, that applies too. So what are the next steps? Closing the funding round. Actually, we were there already, right? We started all of this in April. And within two weeks or so, we had raised the complete amount. And we sent around the contract, the contracts were signed. However, when it came down to wiring and actually, you know, um, uh, bringing the money to Costa Rica, two, three people, because of personal reasons, not judging here, but um, uh, decided that uh, they had to pull out on the last moment notice. So that's why we are still here, and that's why we are still having to close the round again. The company, however, is registered. The bank account has been opened. Um, those that are invested have already wired the money, so all of this is done. Uh, we have obtained proposals for constructions, and as I've said, also the titles have already been moved. Um, the paper you've seen, so again, we're just ready to roll um, once all checks are signed and the money hits the accounts. So, what does it mean financially? Horrible table, very much aware. I think the number that you want to see is here, the return of invest, Either for 50k invest, I mean it's for everyone the same, right? But if you invest 50k, you will get out net after having paid all taxes 20k plus. So um, we are talking about for roughly 40% return on invest. This includes an appreciation of the property as well as rental income of three years. So the 40% is after four years as of today, right? If we start building today, we need one year to build it, rent it out three years. That's our assumption right now and then sell it in the fourth year, and then we talk about the 40% return. We had a conversation about the underlying assumptions. We are certain that they were rather conservative, um, so we believe that we could go higher as well. Okay, uh, even more boring stuff, it's taxes, and yet probably important for some of you. How is all of this taxed? First of all, if you're a foreign shareholder in a Sociedad Anonima, I hope I pronounced that correctly, that's the type of company, it's kind of like that. what the LLC is in the United States. We chose this type of company. You're not having to do any personal tax filings in the United States, uh, in Costa Rica, sorry. Uh, the company, however, um, will have to find an annual return. Uh, we have uh, Carlos Camacho who will support us in this. This is the CPA of uh, Lico Village, and uh, he will also be... Okay. Okay. <laughs> Certainly we'll have someone who can do that for us. Um, then what the, is the tax burden? We pay 30% income tax, that's just normal in Costa Rica, on the rental income, for example, and then 50% dividend tax. However, if you live in a country with a double treaty arrangement, then it's only 5%. In Germany, it could be one. Um, I know that Spain is another. Mexico should also be on the list. Unfortunately, not the United States. Hmm? Yeah, fantastic. So uh, you save 10% in taxes there as well. Okay, so how is the legal framework? The legal framework is a, a partnership agreement. In this partnership agreement, again, we clarify basically all the self-use. We clarify that uh, Yoko is building it. Um, we clarify uh, that uh, Yoko is represented by Learn. Um, I'm representing the other investors um, in this. So all of this is set in the partnership agreement. We are also defining the point of sale so that this is pretty clear. And we define tax matters and all of this. Um, then there's the Pacto Constitutivo Evo. That's the founding agreement. Again, we have all of this. And Adrian sits there on the table. Uh, he is the lawyer who has helped us set this up. Thanks again. And um, <laughs> he's done a fantastic job. And yeah, he will uh, he will basically run that show. And this is more the um, well the administrative things that we have to do. What is, however, important is. This document, which is the official document, constitutes the fact that we have to come together once a year and this is also where we can decide on changing self-use um, regulations, for example. And it also decides on the fact, or it gives us um, by law the uh, requirement to 
keep or retain always 5% of the profit for a legal reserve fund, which is only paid out in the end. But so we would always have a reserve. Right, so we have uh, quite a few people um, that have already committed, that have already wired the money. And so together with Yoko Village, we have 750k on the bank or in titles um, contributed to the company. We're currently looking for an additional 300k and uh, that is what we are hoping to close as soon as possible. So once again, that we can be here in a year's time and, uh, and enjoy the house. Make it happen. Woo! 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 <laughs> and this also brings me very much to the end and I would like to end that with a small story. And the story is from uh, Russell Conwell. He is the founder of Temple University. That's from a speech that he once gave um, uh, over like 120 years ago, if I'm not mistaken. And in the story, he talks about a Persian farmer, Ali Hafid, who is extremely rich and lives at a river. The river is called Indus. It flows through the Himalayas. And at some point, there are some merchants passing by, and they tell him about a lot of diamonds out there in the world. And he says, oh wow, I also want to get that. So he sells his farm, he goes out into the world in search for the diamonds. He doesn't find them. And he dies in a foreign country in poverty. <laughs> the farmer who bought then the farm from Ali Hafet, or who took the farm over, he took his camels then once to the river that was nearby. And while the camels were drinking, he found rocks and we really broke them open there were a lot of diamonds inside. It was the foundation of the Golconda mine in India. So what does the story tell us? We often have the gems and the diamonds right in our backyard. We don't have to go out. And I do hope that we are here all together and make this happen. We do not need to go out and ask other people, but focus on the people here. So I hope that we can convince some of you to become a part of this and co-own the nice villa here. Yes! Questions? Question for you on the rental side. What do you, what do you anticipate the rent, like an owner's rent being per night or per week? Maybe you mentioned that it's going to cost each owner unless you guys change it. So what is, it, what is, what is, what is that rent out for per night in the ownership? Yeah, so it's going to be rented out on Airbnb, and the owners pay 25% less than the Airbnb rate of that period. Yeah. Um, now, we have different assumptions for low season and main season. Uh, that's something that I can say that I know from the top of my head. I think for low season, we use the assumption of 60% occupancy rate, so therefore rather conservative, and high season, 80-85%. Uh, I would need to go back and check what we assume then as a daily rate. Um, yeah. Just curious, that might play a part in the Sure. Would you know right now? It's a few hundreds of dollars per night, mm -hmm. depending on the year. Yeah. This year has been much lower, for example. The years before we've seen it been much higher. But if you take the last five years... If you take the last five years, you, you're only seeing growth in prices. It's getting more expensive. How much does the house cost? <laughs> so the house itself for the building, you mean? Yeah. So for the building, we are assuming um, 700k, right? We are still raising 750 because we include 25k for furniture, and we include a buffer of 25k. And we're not assuming that that is a formal offer from our Sorry. partner. Yeah. We've got a formal proposal, so we've got it on paper, and um, but that is signed. That is signed, and that's something we can work with. Any other questions? And that's not the case, then I think... Tobias, why, why are you doing this? Huh. So, Andre mentioned that I've... Uh, um, that uh, I got to know David uh, quite some time ago, and I think David uh, uh, sent me the first video when he was rocking around here in Yoko North, and it was Merlin Idea. And uh, I've been following it, and I have rarely found any project that is so aligned with what I'm doing. 
whether or not this is the search for community or the entrepreneurship uh, character of all of it. And uh, I always try um, to get a foot in the door, but I also know that I've got so many things going on that I want to make sure that I'm not overburdening myself, and that's why I was looking for the right setup. And again, I'm coming back, and that's why I gave you the first intro, I really do believe in doing things together. I think lots of good things can come out of it. And I've seen that over and over again with all my four companies. So I believe in co-ownership. I believe in the fact uh, that we as people coming together, sharing something, that we can actually make it uh, work. And I would hope that this won't be the only chunk venture, but only the start of at least the second, where we then go long term. Mm.